I want to do, do one more example about capacitors, uh, just to help you guys a little bit with tomorrow as well, um, since I think I haven't done an explicit example for this. Um, so uh, the, the key thing, re really the, the key thing to learn out of all the capacitor circuit problems. So when you have a circuit inside a capacitor like this, um, sorry, a capacitor inside a circuit like this, um, for example, something like this, or uh, let's say there's a homework, or there's an end of chapter problem that looked uh, something like this. Um, okay. um, so uh, the key thing is to know how all the variables, let's call that C1, C2, C3. So for each C1, C2, C3, C4, right? So for each capacitor, let's call it CI, you, you should label plus Q1 and minus Q1, right? So each one you will label plus or minus QI on the plate, and also it will have a potential difference across it, like that. Right. So for each, and the whole goal of all these capacitors in circuit problems is to understand the relationship between all these variables. Okay. So in the last lecture, we've talked about, for example, if you have two things um, in series, just like that. So it's pretty simple. Minus one plus Q1 plus Q2 minus Q2 like this. So let me zoom in here. Okay. So you can immediately uh, identify some relationships out of here. For example, uh, that this side and this side is connected by a wire, right? So everything in blue is basically a uh, conductor. It's a neutral conductor because there's no reason why it's initially there's a net charge, right? So um, it's, it's a neutral conductor like this. So what does that mean? That means all the charges on here should be zero. So that means if you have, let's say five coulombs, positive five coulombs on this side, you better have negative five coulombs on this side because everything has to be neutral. So that means you should, you'll be able to deduce a relationship out of this where Q1 equals to Q2. The magnitude of Q1, so whatever the amount of charges on this side, so just for an example, if, <laughs> well, thanks, uh, sorry. Um, what was I saying? Right, there's, so if there's plus five coulombs on this side, there better be negative five coulombs on this side, right? Um, so if there's negative five coulombs on this plate, then uh, how, how many coulombs can you attract to this plate? You will be able to attract plus five, right? Uh, you cannot attract more than that you can, uh, because it has to be equal and opposite, right? So that means you, you see the, uh, whatever's on Q1, you can say the, the magnitude of that is equal to that. Or a better way to, or another way to think about this is Q1 uh, minus Q1 plus positive Q2 is, so everything on the blue, that's why I'm using blue color here, everything on the blue plate is, um, if you add them together, uh, then it should be zero, right? Because it's neutral. So basically I'm saying you add up all the charges on the blue um, conductor, it should be zero because there's no net charge, okay? So as a result, you can deduce, if you put it to the other side, right? So you have Q2 equals Q1. So you have the same result. You can think about it either way, just more visually and intuitively like that, like I, what I just did, and, uh, or uh, more rigorously, more formally, right? With the equation like this and say, I've add, I'll add up everything on here, right? I'll add up minus five and plus five, uh, and D should add to zero like that. Right? And if this is plus five, likewise, uh, this should be uh, minus five that way, okay? So uh, the, what I want to say in here is to, uh, to show you how to deduce these things out and don't memorize these. Uh, sometimes there are, um, some students would, uh, uh, or even some lecturers would teach this and say, uh, whenever they're in series, the play, the, the Q1 would equal to Q2 and just memorize. If it's series, it's this way. If it's in parallel, it's the other way. And that is extremely difficult to remember. Extremely, and you don't learn anything by just reciting it, right? Um, and also, even if you do, let's say you went through the trouble and memorized that rule, then you'll run into trouble when you go to here because let's say I need to relate C1, C2, C3, C4. Are they in series or parallel? Neither. C1 is in parallel with C2, uh, but they're, they're not in parallel with series with C3, right? So if I ask you, can you relate C1 and C3 to me? Um, you can't do, there's no, now you break down. Um, but let's see with this understanding, if you understand this, how can, you, um, how can you answer this? So let me make up a question. In fact, let me make this a little bit easier. I'll just make this one capacitor on this side so that I have one less thing. And you can carry the same logic forward. Um, to relate, so relate all the variables. So 
here's an exercise for you tonight to relate all the variables between Q1, Q2, Q3, and also Q equivalent, I should say. So you have C1, C2, C3, right? And you also um, have the idea of the whole thing can be represented by one big capacitor like this. So how, how do all these things relate together? Can you write a formula to relate all them together or more than one formula and uh, same as this? Like that, okay. So I'll do, um, I'll do one of, uh, uh, let me redraw that first. So we can have, the whole thing can be replaced by a big capacitor like this. So plus EQ, minus EQ, right? and then you have equivalent. Yeah, so let's call this exercise A, exercise B, plus EQ. So try to do it with these two configurations. I think in an exam, uh, in a test or exam, I won't test you more than three, I think. Um, it, well, in principle, try, you can try to do four, uh, but just for time purpose and, and simple, as a day of exam, we probably won't do that. But uh, for your own purpose, if you want to make the original configuration where there's four, uh, if you can do that, you can do, you can do three. So that's also a good exercise for yourself. All right, so um, yeah, let me just, let me do maybe part, maybe B for you. Um, so how do you, should you analyze? So the first thing I would think of is this. It's all this blue part is connected by wires. So this is basically the same idea over here. Can you see this, right? So when I say this should end up neutral, everything here should end up neutral. So let's put in the variables and see what we can, what you can deduce out of this. Minus Q1 plus Q2 minus Q2. Q3 minus Q3. Okay, so with the blue, with my blue pen, what can I deduce out of these charges? I can deduce that. Can you see? So I can deduce that um, Q1 and Q2 together should equal to Q3. Okay, so uh, let's say I have five coulombs over here. Let's say I have positive five coulombs on this side. Um, then what does that mean? Then these two should add up to negative five coulombs. Do you agree? Right? Because everything is neutral. So whatever is on this side, so you, there's two ways to think about it. You can just use what I said, like the, the logic to logic your way through it. Q1 plus Q2 should equal to Q3. Um, or you can actually double check yourself, even if you logic your way through it, double check yourself by actually adding these things up, such as minus Q1 plus minus Q2 plus positive Q3 should add up to zero because everything in blue is neutral, right? Where they should add up to neutral. So if you have however many charge on one side, the other two sides should add up. And then now you can see, what do I get? I get Q3, let me throw these on the other side. I get the exact same thing there. So that's a good check, right? So you can think of it two either way. Um, it's good to learn both ways, but um, yeah. So uh, this is, how you relate it, um, uh, my question is to relate the variables Q1, Q2, and Q equivalent. All right, how do I relate Q equivalent? Let me use orange this time and look at this side. What do I learn on this side? Let me look at the, the left-hand side first. Look at this side, since it's positive. Okay. So what does the equivalent capacitance mean? Equivalent capacitance over here, it means that if I replace all these C1, C2, C3 with one big capacitor, then it should do the same job as the original one, right? So uh, if I, um, this is not coloring well, right, good. Yeah, um, so I can learn from the orange side that QEQ should equal to Q1 plus Q2. Okay, can you see that? Because these two orange plates, um, if, I, if, you, if I take an eraser and scrap out everything in the, in the blue and then um, actually combine these, right, and make it, one wire like this, then I basically have the bottom scenario, right? So Q1 plus Q2 better equals to QEQ, all right? Let me go back like that, okay? So this is the relationship you can deduce out of it, out of the orange side. And uh, how about on the other side? So you can do the same thing. This side and this side should be the same, right? Because if you remove the blue part in the middle, basically, you basically, and then connect these together, um, just make that one wire, you basically have the equivalent capacitance. So the, um, uh, what can you do with the or, uh, yellow side is minus Q3, minus Q3 should equal to minus QEQ, right? Whatever's on here should equal to here. Obviously that means uh, QEQ equals to Q3. You can see there's a sanity check over here, right? If Q1 plus Q2 equals to QEQ, Q E Q equals to Q three. That means Q one plus Q two must equals to Q three. So that's a that's a good um, double triple check of everything is consistent, right? So once you learn how to read the diagram, so you 
might or might not get a short answer questions to ask you to do something like this. Wink, wink. Um, so the idea is to test you to learn how to read the diagrams. Once you're able to read the diagram, you, can, you, you don't need to memorize any formula, right? So that's, that's the goal here. Um, how about uh, delta Vs? Um, let me use a different color, All right? So, um, and then, the, yeah, how to read the delta V. So you draw this, right? Delta V1, delta V2, and delta V3. Okay, so first thing I would see is V1 plus V2. Um, I'm just gonna say V1, V2, even though I write a delta. Um, uh, V1 must equal to V2 uh, because the potential difference here is the same as the potential difference here, right? Because this point is the same absolute potential and this point is the same absolute potential on the right. So um, yeah, uh, so the first relationship you can deduce is this. How does this tie into V3? All right, let's see. So if I take V2 plus V3, Okay, so if I add these two together, they should be the exact same as VEQ, right? Because the point over here, point A, is exactly the same potential as this point. And point B is the exact same point as this point, essentially, right? So if, as long as the wire itself is an ideal wire, that there's no resistance, then these points are at the same poten absolute potential. So the potential difference between um, this point and essentially this point, right? So V2 plus V3, is the potential difference over AB is the same as this. Okay, so I know how V3 is related. V2 plus V3 is, so now you can form an equation. So once you learn how to read the goal again, let me reiterate this, learn, learn how to read these, uh, extract these formulas out of it. Um, still pretty colorful and cute. <laughs> uh, then then you, you don't have to memorize anything essentially. Um, and uh, since V1 and V2 is the same, you can look at the top and say that V1 plus V3 is also VEQ. So that is also the same, right? V1 plus V3 is also VEQ. Okay, so you can actually have a huge long formula. So this is how all V1, V2, V3, and VEQ are all related like this. Right. How about C? Okay, so this is this is the easiest part. Um, I will not erase that. Um, running out of space, right, so I'll move this here. Okay, and uh, so C the C's are the easiest to combine, right? So just use the rule. Okay, so this is parallel. So C one and C two. Um, I write it over here. So C one uh, use orange. So C1, um, C12 is C1 plus C2, right? Because they're in parallel, if you remember the rules. So the only rule, I, I, the only formulas I recite I, that I commit to memory out of ca for capacitors is the is equivalent capacitors formula for series and parallel. That one I do recite. And actually what I do is I re recite for resistors and then for capacitors, I remember it's, I just remember it the other way around, okay? So for parallel, it's just a simple add. And then for the last one here, you, if you want to combine all together, right? So all together, it's C12 now is in series with C3, like that. Um, so let's just make that, substitute everything back in the original variables. Right? So this is how all the Cs are related. Okay? If you really want, you can turn this upside down, uh, just invert this, just to make it even clearer. You don't have to simplify this any further than this. I think this is either the last one or the second to last one is perfectly good, all right? Any questions about this? Okay, so yeah, um, I basically answered everything for version B. Uh, you might want to um, try this exercise with CEQ and you know all the Q1, Q2, Q3, C1, C2, C3, B1, B2, B3 with uh, version A. All right, okay, good. So now let's uh, move back to magnetism, all right? So magnetic force, right? So it's a new non-contact force that we have. And um, at the end of last Thursday's last lecture, um, I've uh, had an extra slide over here. For, I don't know how many of you have done this. So let me um, do a quick review uh, and give you the answer to this as well. Maybe not every, oops, maybe not uh, every variation over here, but you can do the rest. Uh, I'll give you some idea. Right, so let's start with uh, number two, this one. Okay, so if I have a proton shooting through a magnetic field like this, okay, so is this into the page or out of the page? Well, it, it, it's giving away over here, but uh, remember if it's across, um, then you're, imagine looking at the tail end of an arrow, uh, that's how I remember it, so it's going like into the page. Um, right, so the magnetic field's going into the page, the proton's shooting in here, all right? So which, what uh, force will it experience? So remember the, 
there's two ways to think about it. Um, one way is to use Fleming's left hand rule, right? um, so where your first finger represents what? Put it in the chat if you remember. Your second finger represents what? And your thumb represents what? This is invent this little mnemonic is remember, uh, invented by Fleming. Fleming's left hand rule. There's another way to, if you don't use Fleming's left hand rule, which is actually slightly more advised, is actually um, learn how to actually do cross, cross products because this is more general and more beneficial for the rest of the course and uh, your 3C as well, um, is to do cross products. So what to do cross products is if you do V cross B, um, always use your right hand. Um, this is a mathematical rule of doing cross products. Um, putting your right hand um, to line up along the first vector that you want to do a cross product, so that's V, so line it up across V, and then try to wrap your hand towards, right, wrap your hands towards the second vector. Your thumb will tell you the result of that, okay? All right, so let's try it with, um, let's try it with the second one first. Um, so protons going in, right, so the velocity is, the, so the velocity is going in this way, and the field, B field, is going into the page, okay? So put your right hand along, I think the zoom camera is actually mirrored, uh, so just do it on your screen yourself. Put your right hand pointing along V, all right? Now, uh, which way is B? B is in, right? So now try to find a way to wrap your right hand's finger after pointing towards V towards the, in a 90 degree fashion towards B. And then which way does your thumb point? Hopefully your thumb is now pointing uh, down, right? So that means as soon as the proton comes in here, actually not even that far, right? As soon as it is within the vicinity of the magnetic field, the proton should immediately experience Oops, sorry. <laughs> Hopefully, am I back? It's not a it's not a three B lecture if this doesn't happen at least once. <laughs> All right, uh, good. Let me make sure I'm still recording and uh, my screen is up. Good. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so as, as soon as uh, the proton is inside the vicinity of the B field, it should be pointing down, right? You'll get a force this way. Now, um, if you use Fleming's left hand rule, uh, this is the mnemonics to remember it. Um, first finger uh, it starts with an F, so remember that as field. Second finger, you ha that's the only word with a C, so current has to go here. That's, that's the only word that starts with a C. And thumb, um, whatever you want to, um, from is a result, <laughs> so uh, I don't have a good excuse for that, but uh, try to make up one to, to, to convince yourself that it's force. Um, uh, if TH sounds like force to you. All right. All right, so put your first finger in the field, in the direction of the field, which is now into the screen, but remember it's called Fleming's left hand rule, so definitely use your left hand. Almost everything else is right hand in math and physics, but except for this special left hand rule. Um, and then uh, second finger is current. All right, so if the proton is moving this way, which way is the current going? Right. So imagine you have more than one proton moving this way. So the current is going to the left, right? So I think the zoom camera might be mirrored, but uh, uh, on your screen, it should be going to the left. So which way is your left thumb pointing? Down. So you see either way, you should get a result like that. It is interesting that now you, you, if you have a force like this, what will happen? So a force will create an acceleration, right? It'll, it'll try to accelerate it downwards. So now the, it will push the particle to maybe the proton to maybe over here instead of going straight, right? Now what happens? Try to repeat this process. I'll just speed things up uh, for the purpose of lecture. Um, now the convince yourself, go home and convince yourself that the new force now is going this way as long as its velocity is going this way. And then if there's a new force going this way, it's going to move it um, even further away from its straight line, right? So it's gonna tilt it down like this. And uh, the force is gonna be this way. And as you can see, it will leave the screen B 
being bent. So you can actually use a magnet. What we learn out of this is you can actually use a magnet uh, for the, before yeah, the, the first answer is downwards uh, as soon as you're here. Um, but uh, yeah, but it, it doesn't stay downwards along, uh, for long because it'll keep moving and then it'll become diagonal and then it'll go to the right. And then um, if it leaves the plane, it'll keep going in a constant velocity. But uh, if there's more, um, if there's more uh, electric, uh, sorry, magnetic field all around, uh, all around it, let's say it's filling the whole screen, right? So the proton would continue to move like this. Can you see what, what the result shape, resultant shape is? That's right, it'll go in a circle uh, because this is exactly what you will call centripetal force. If you'll remember from 3A, a centripetal force is a force that is perpendicular to the velocity and always pointing to the center of a circle. So if you have a force that constantly pulls you towards the center, almost like the moon being pulled around the earth, that's why the moon goes in circles around the earth. This is the same idea. If you have a force that keeps pushing, in this case, it's not gravitational force, it's a magnetic force, right? a magnetic force, if you want to label that for clarity, if you want to emphasize it. Um, this time the magnetic force is constantly pulling it in the middle, right? So if you have just a partial plane like this, you will be able to bend the proton out. Uh, if you have a huge plane, you actually can make the proton go in circles like this. And this is extremely useful. We're going to talk about application very soon in the next slide. And this is extremely useful in so many, many applications. You can actually bend extremely fast shooting particles around. Let me know in the chat, how many of you heard of CERN or the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland that they, that they collide particles together and make um, uh, uh, the people who don't know what they're talking about keep saying they'll make a big bang and swallow the earth. <laughs> but uh, how many of you heard of that, the LHC, Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland? No one? Oh, it's a shame. Uh, that, uh, so it's a huge collider uh, of, um, it, with basically um, like that they should, particles like uh, actually protons, um, actually they actually do shoot protons um, through the ring and then um, they make the protons go in circles uh, at almost 99.9999 percent the speed of light. Um, I think there's four decimal places there. Uh, the speed of light is extremely impressive and then they take a second beam of proton. Um, they, have a, they have two um, tubes, one on top of another, um, that is 27 kilometers long it's around like 19 miles or something like that. Um, and this one goes in the opposite direction. They make the proton go in the opposite direction like that. And then at some point they open a hole and allow them to collide head on after they spin fast enough to 99.99% the speed of light. Um, they allow them to collide straight on. What that happens is they break the protons in, in complete oblivion. They break into parts and then take pictures of it. Of course, not like a normal picture, but huge devices essentially taking pictures of it and they find out what the protons is made of. Um, this is the field of particle physics. Technically the full name is elementary particle physics. Um, so this is one application here. Uh, how do they bend the protons is um, over here they keep putting a magnetic field on top of the proton at the right magnetic field strength um, in order to bend it with the right radius and uh, have it go that way like this. Um, so elementary particle physics is a whole subject of finding out what are protons made of, what are protons and neutrons and what are everything made, what are the elementary particles of the universe. It's uh, also part of my research um, area. So that's one very interesting um, uh, uh, application. Uh, just to give you another example here, this time with currents, uh, because you can do number three yourself because it is also a particle. Remember if it's negative, um, then you need to flip whatever result. So oh, yeah, maybe we'll mention the negative one. Um, if, the, if, the, if it is uh, a negative charge moving this way, then um, whatever Q here is gonna be negative, right? So if you get V cross B pointing one way, the force is going to be the opposite of whatever V cross B is, okay? So let's see, um, how, how, do, how do I find the force on this guy? First of all, where is the magnetic field? Well, there's a current here. So the current is gonna generate a magnetic field that goes around, uh, around it, right? So let me draw it in light blue. Um, remember the magnetic field is going to go around it like this. So uh, use your right hand rule to find out which way um, the, the magnetic field is going. And that means at this particular point over here, which way is the B pointing? In or out of the screen? At this particular point, the B is pointing, the B field is pointing out of the screen, right? And the velocity is going upwards, right? Okay. So also at this particular point, the B field is going into the screen. It's going around the wire like this. So it's going out here and in here. 
Okay, we'll go back to the minus one. The velocity is here. The b is out. Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's use our right hand rule. Um, so put your hand along v. So put your hand going up. Now try to wrap it out of the screen. The only way you do it is tilt your hand uh, one way, so you can wrap it out of the screen, right? So the force is to the right. However, that is just v cross b. The charge is negative, so q is negative. So the force is actually negative of the v cross b direction. So the force is to the left. So that's how you determine that. If you insist on using the uh, Fleming's left hand rule, you can also do that. But just this time, instead of, remember current is the flow of positive charge, right? So think of if you have a negative charge, if the problem, if the short answer question is gives you a negative charge, then that means just imagine the current going the opposite way. So even though the negative charge is flowing up, imagine the conventional current, how we define current is going down. So you can put your second finger is pointing down, uh, the B is pointing out of the screen uh, with your left hand. Hopefully um, you agree with me that your thumb is now pointing to the uh, left of the screen. Right? So you can use this uh, 3D loser sign, I mean, uh, that means left hand rule to do it or use the um, cross product rule to do this. All right, same thing with the wire. I think uh, I'll save some time and I'll do that. You guys can uh, confirm that on Piazza. So um, yeah, let's uh, make a, uh, yeah, let's see what are some uh, important applications. And the first one I'm going to uh, talk about is the probably the most important of all is making an electric motor. So we can actually make an electric car out of this. By the way, a uh, quick uh, studying tip advice. Uh, this week, because you have test five on Thursday and the homework is due later, uh, um, I, uh, so after you deal with, you probably are studying for tomorrow's uh, test, that's fine. Um, after that, instead of going to the homework, make, uh, probably uh, I would suggest focus your efforts in studying for the test first um, and then the homework. So tonight, um, I, I, with, within, after the lecture tonight, I will, um, I will, pop, uh, I will finish the practice uh, short answer questions for the test five. Um, so everything like this, um, just uh, again, a small tip is these are very, very popular. I haven't confirmed what will come up in test five, but these are extremely popular <laughs> questions or short answer questions. It's extremely easy to ask um, if you know how to use this rule. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll put out the um, practice test for test five to, within tonight. Um, and also if I can get to it, the homework as well. Um, if I cannot get to it, um, then I'll publish the homework tomorrow. Um, and I'll also make it a little bit shorter than normal um, since you have less days to complete it. Or maybe I'll extend the deadline. I'll see what, I'll see what happens. Okay. All right, so um, yeah, how do we make a motor? Um, here's an idea. So you just need to take a north-south, a permanent magnet like this, and then let's pass a loop of wire. So I'll pass a loop of wire through it like this, okay? So the magnetic field lines are going from north to south like this. All right, so let's connect this to a battery and see what happens. So um, let's see which direction should I go? I'll go this way. Um, like this, okay? So it's a bit tough to see. Uh, so let me not draw the battery and just draw which way the current goes because this is in 3D. So let's say the current goes like this um, and let me draw the side view. Um, so I'm looking at it from the side like this. So I have uh, north, south, and then the current here is going into the page and the current here is going out of the page, okay? So uh, on this side, it's uh, going in and then going, uh, the wire goes across like that um, and uh, going out again. So this is, the, this, is this side and then uh, coming straight out um, on here, right? So this is the axis of the, of the loop. So, um, and I will make it so that, um, I won't draw it explicitly, but I'll make, uh, I'll put a ring around here and make it uh, so that it can rotate freely. So this is a loop that can rotate freely about this axis, right? So this is a rotation axis, axis of rotation, like that, right? So it, it can freely uh, rotate around either way, okay? So let's see what happens. So uh, use your uh, left-hand rule or right-hand rule either way you like, and try to convince yourself that the, if the current comes out, you can do it on this side. Um, the current is coming out of the page. The field is going to the left. Um, which way is the force pointing? So you can test it right now in front of your screen. The force should be pointing up. Let's double check, field, current, uh, field. Hang on, it's down. Uh, should I reverse my current? Let's see, just double check. Just want to make sure it lines up with my picture. I'm gonna show. Myself. Yeah, 
All right, that should be going the other way. Um, yeah, all right, so let me switch the magnet. So I'll have the B field go the other way. So the force on this wire should be pointing up. And the force on this wire, uh, you can test it yourself. So which way will the force go? Uh, it should be pointing down. What, does, what happens to this? Then the whole thing will tilt if it's allowed to rotate over here, right? So the whole loop will, so this side basically, you'll get a force that pushes up it up. This side, you'll get a force that pushes it down. So the whole thing will now get tilted like this. And now, uh, what happens to a force? If you try to do the same analysis um, with the fields, you know, the, the, it's still in the field like this, right? Which way would the force point? The force will still pu push up, right? So you can convince yourself this. I'll just go quicker since it's a lecture um, and push this down, right? So uh, if it's allowed to rotate freely over here, now it'll start rotating, right? So I'll just draw a dotted line over here first. And uh, I'll keep drawing this. So now you see I've already created some movement out of just passing a current through a wire that is in the presence of a permanent magnet. And then um, when it's up to this point, what you, now you probably see the goal is I want to, if I can connect this to a battery, I want this to just keep on going faster and faster, right? I just want to have this keep spinning because if I can, then uh, the next thing I'll do is I'll connect the other end to a wheel of some sort. And then uh, I can basically, if this side is a battery, right, being connected to the wires here, right, then I can basically turn the wheel and this is how you can make a car or any machines, any electric devices that way or uh, your electric fan or uh, your uh, dehumidifier or, um, you know, wh whatever that needs to move. Um, or you can uh, now connect this with a rope and connect it to some very heavy load, um, uh, garbage or whatever, and then turn on your motor and now this will keep spinning and then rotate around the rope and then it will pull up whatever load you need to lift up the building. So that's how you make elevators as well. And basically anything with electricity, as long as you can pass electricity through this, you can keep this rotating. So that's the goal, right? So um, now when it goes to here, we run into a slight trouble is that the, <coughs> the force is pointing upwards. This is pointing downwards. You can double check yourself with your rules. Now this is not going to do anything to it. It's not going to make it keep rotating. But if, if it was following the momentum from this step to this step, like one, two, three over here, hopefully, right? It was rotating like this, it was rotating like this. It will still have a little bit of rotation. It will have some momentum that carries it forward and it will keep moving it, right? So the, um, as long as it has some momentum, it should um, be able to get me to the next stage, past this halfway point and have it over here like this, okay, right? Now let's look at the forces again. If you use your left-hand rule and then analyze it again, you will see this happens. Now this is slightly worrisome because now it seems to be, right, if, if, I, if I keep going to the next one, if it manages to make it through halfway and go to here, right, the forces are going to be like this and like this. Now, then, then my wheel is not complete. <laughs> my wheel has rotated from here to 90 degrees. Um, and then now it seems like uh, either I'm at step four or step five, it's trying to twist it back to the other way. So now I just have a wheel that just go back and forth. That's not a very good car. I won't go get anywhere sitting in this car, right? So how do I fix this? I want, what I want is I want this to, the, the new, after the halfway point, the force to point this way. I'll make it F prime. This is what I want, right? Then I can complete the cycle. Um, so how do I make this suddenly flip the sign to this way? Here's the genius part. Uh, you can either flip the magnet or flip the current. Right? If you flip the magnet, everything will reverse, or if you flip the current, again, everything will reverse. But what's easier is actually flipping the current. Right? So um, there's a permanent magnet you put in your Tesla car, uh, whatever, and then you pass uh, the current through it. Um, but every half, uh, t every 180 degrees rotation, you program it so that it flips the other way. I'll show you a diagram how you make it. Uh, there's a clever way to flip it automatically. Um, but if, imagine if you can, now you will have the other force. So now I'll use yellow to say you flip it instead to have now the currents uh, going out here and the current going um, in here, like this. Right? So this is after the halfway point, the key is you flip the current direction. Right? 
So if you can do that, so basically um, what you need is a power source that every half a turn, you start changing the direction. And this is what's called alternating current. How many of you heard of alternating currents and direct currents, AC and DC? Let me know if you've heard of that in the chat. So this, I write this down. So this is cool. Cool, good job in the lab. Do you know it in your outlet and when you plug a plug in your wall, is that an alternating current or a direct current? So alternating current, as it suggests, this is actually the symbol. Um, instead of writing a battery, you write it like this. So sometimes people actually specify it as well um, with a little squiggly line. So versus direct current has a well-defined direction, right? So you have, a, you have a fixed battery that, you know, you can't change it, the current goes one way. Here, the current flips back and forth. Um, at a typical time, uh, um, so the, basically what you have in your wall, basically it's an alternating current, everything that comes out. And I'll, in the next lecture, we'll talk more about why that is and uh, why alternating current is basically much more useful. So almost everything um, that you plug in a wall is alternating current, um, ex unless you buy a battery from Walmart. Right? If you actually buy a little battery, then that will just flow in one way. So those are direct currents. So if you have handheld devices, like a torch or something, um, then uh, those are if you use any batteries that you need to put in, those are direct current devices. If you plug anything in a wall, um, they're all alternating current. So uh, a typical alternating current is from 50 to 60 hertz in our household. Okay. Uh, this is for uh, US. Um, US is around 50, uh, the rest of the world uses around 60, it's not a big difference, um, <laughs> but uh, US and Canada use 50. Um, so that what uh, hertz is, uh, you, it's basically number per second. It's the unit number per second. So that means it flips back and forth 50 times per second. Um, so uh, if, by the way, we can change this. Um, there's ways to change it. If you want the car to go faster, you can change the hertz of, uh, of it. So it goes even faster. Uh, but if you don't change it, if you just plug a AC motor, so this is actually an AC motor, directly in your wall, what you'll get is roughly 50 turns per second, like this, um, of a mole. But there's ways to change this. Okay, I'll show you some pictures. Um, apologize, I will overrun a little bit. Um, I think I'll just because to give us enough time um, to uh, cover everything, uh, I'll end with around 8.40. So 20 minutes from now, I'll go on for another uh, 15 or 20 minutes. And uh, I want to finish all the applications over here. Okay. Um, I won't, yeah, I won't go beyond uh, 8.40, just so you have enough time to study. All right. So, um, yeah, here's a diagram for uh, the V cross B, if you want to see it. Uh, they draw it better than my drawing. Um, and let's see, all right, let's see, what do we get, what do we get here? Um, uh, this is not the right word, this should say field, uh, but don't worry about that for now. All right, so let's focus on right over here. Okay. So the red part, um, this is just a loop, uh, the red and blue is just to clarify which side is which around the axis. Um, the red side is welded completely to a ring. The blue side is completely welded to this ring. So as this spin around um, on the axis, the ring you know, uh, spins with it in a circular motion. But the red is only connected to the uh, top ring and the blue is only connected to the bottom ring. So uh, the blue doesn't touch the orange ring here. Ring here right? So uh, each ring only touch one side of it. All right. So uh, these are called uh, slip rings um, because they, what they do is they slip around uh, the brushes. All right. So what, what is this? this? You connect to a, a power source, an AC power source, an alternating current. And um, so you see that, uh, let's say here, the current goes in and it makes the current goes along the blue side, right? And then it will contact the ring, which is also a conductor, and then the current will go out here. Now, as soon as this goes past halfway, all you have to do is change these two black arrows, change the direction of this. So, so now um, the current will flow in from the top one, right? So instead of flowing out from the top one, it's flowing in from the top one. So this is how you can uh, make it uh, so that it keeps spinning and tune your alternating current like this. Okay. So this is the engineering part of it. Uh, you won't get tested on this, but I think this is a very important application, right? So the engineers devised this out, which is very clever because if you ask, um, uh, 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 if you naively just connect this to a wire, even if you have AC source, this starts rotating. Now your wire starts to tangle <laughs> into like spaghetti, right? They'll start tangling up, but now this way they won't tangle. Um, of course, there's also other engineering pieces. You need to make it rotate freely and you put axes and all, but that um, I don't care. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, hopefully you see how this works, especially if you, extra picture. So this is, uh, as you see, the AC current. Um, and this is the slip ring and the brushes, right? slipping contact called brushes. Um, and it rotates with the AC current. 
here's another diagram. You can see how one wire is connected to one ring, the other wire is connected to the other ring. So as it rotates, the brushes will um, just have an alternating current. Um, and then now on the other side, you can connect to a shaft to, to a, um, a wheel like that. Okay. I think I have a lot of um, diagrams. Now, what if you want to connect it to a direct current and still able to make a motor? You can actually do that. So you can actually create a DC motor, let me call it application 1B. Because surely uh, you might have seen these little devices, um, right? That you you connect to a uh, to a nine volt battery like this that you can get from any grocery stores, uh, and then uh, you can connect this to a wheel um, like this. Um, so, if there's anyone who's interested in engineering or play with these toys as a boy or as a girl uh, when you're young, uh, you'll see these motors. Uh, you might have played with these, right? So, surely you should be able to make something happen over here, even with a DC source, and you can. All right, since this is more engineering and physics, I won't go into too much detail. You can read the textbook. You can read the textbook uh, more on that, um, but I'll just roughly show you this. Um, it has to be a little bit more complicated. It's your slip rings um, has to be actually cut in half, right? So the left half of this is connected to that side, the right half is connected to this side. So the current will only uh, flow in one direction. So this is a direct current. But as soon as the, the loop go through the halfway point, then you see that this part now gets flipped to this side. And instead of, the, uh, let's say the top one over here, having the current flowing into the loop, and now as it goes to the other side, it's flowing out of the loop. So it will always make sure that the forces, right? so it will always make sure that uh, the force, so it will always make sure the current is flowing into the loop from the left and out of the loop from the right. So make sure the forces is always up on, on this side and always pointing down on this side. Okay. So uh, if, this, if this makes complete sense to you, uh, congratulations. Uh, if this is very confusing, um, you can pause this video when you look back and, uh, or just Google DC motor. Uh, just Google these images, I, that's how I found these, um, and uh, stare at this for another five minutes and hopefully you can see the ingenuity, um, the genius of this design. Right? Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, I won't ask you to draw this diagram out. Um, it's more of an engineering idea. Yeah, uh, so you can see, just to reiterate, as the current always flows in this side, so the force always pushes it up this way and down this way, and make sure it keeps going on flowing. And this is called a DC motor, you can see. I think I have a GIF or a GIF, whatever you call, uh, 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 like this. So you see the, it, the half rings will keep going around, so each time the current is flowing in from one side, making the force go up on one side. Okay, you can Google or YouTube much more of these images, um, but this is how you can cleverly design either AC motor or a DC motor. Okay, so um, I have uh, two more applications. Um, yeah, I should be able to make it in the next 10 minutes. Um, the next one is called a velocity selector. What is this thing? Is imagine you're making an electron gun <laughs> um, and you're shooting electrons out like this. And uh, let's say you're shooting positive charges first. So it's slightly easier. It could be electrons, but positive charges follow my right hand, uh, left hand rule smooth, uh, in a smoother way. And uh, it shoots out charges, electrons or protons or whatever, with quite random velocity. What I want is I want a tube that makes sure by the end of it, um, when they come out, they all come out in the same direction, in the same velocity. So I want to select some special, some specific velocity, right, speed and direction that comes out. And what you can do is make a, take advantage of electric force and magnetic force, all right? So what you can do is, um, let me maybe save some time to not draw it out or show you the diagram while I draw it. Uh, is this a positive or negative charge? This is positive, good, so it should be the same way. Yeah, so what you do is you set up a positive plate, like a capacitor here, but this time you, the point is not to store charge, you just want the electric field. So let me use yellow to draw the electric field. So you set up an electric field like this, and then you pass a magnetic field through the center as well, but in an orthogonal perpendicular fashion. So the electric field is pointing down to, off the screen, and the magnetic field is pointing into the page, into the screen. Okay. What happens? All right, so uh, what happens is in the middle now, when the positive charge comes to the middle over here, it will experience a magnetic force, right? The magnetic force, you can check if the velocity is going this way and the field is going into, use your left hand rule or right hand rule to check that the magnetic force would point up. So you get an FB pointing upwards like this. 
But at the same time, this is a positive charge inside like two capacitors, inside an electric field. So the electric field would create an electric force on the charge that pushes it down, right? So what you want is you want to balance these so that there's no net force so that it can go straight. So what you want is you want FB, the magnitude of FB, I'll emphasize magnitude for now, to equals to this. Well, you know the magnitude of this, if everything is perpendicular, is QVB, the other one is QE, right? With some external field, with some external B field. And that's the charge of the particle, Q, and uh, V is the velocity that it's uh, moving at, is the speed uh, that it's moving at because it's a magnitude. All right, so now you cancel this, and then you will find that basically, if you can tune what you like on your electric field and magnetic field, right? If you can just put more charge here, you'll get a stronger E field. Just put, um, use a stronger magnet, you'll get a larger B field. So if you design correctly this with um, E and B this way, you can precisely select out a specific velocity, right? If you, if you can absorb what I just said, you should appreciate how clever this device is. Because if it is faster, what happens? Well, if V is larger, if it goes, if there's any, so if this is a random source, um, how do you get things to shoot out electrons or particles? You put it under, you put it under a fire, like a Bunsen burner. When things heat up, they jiggle around. There's a lot of vibrational kinetic energy. You know, they jiggle around at some point, they're hot enough, they start spreading out. But they, you can't control what the speed they start, you know, exploding or shooting out or bouncing around. Um, around. Uh, but if you pass them through this device, right, and you set this up correctly, um, let's say, uh, in SI units, this is uh, four whatever SI units, this is two whatever uni SI units, you can select exactly particles that shoot out at two meters per second, right? And then now you can decide a, de design a gun that does that because anything faster than two meters per second, you will create A because the magnetic force is proportional to V. So anything that goes faster than uh, two meters per second, you'll get a larger magnetic force, which means the particle will get bent up um, and maybe hit the ceiling like this and it won't be able to go out. So anything faster than, let's call this the V star, the optimal, the specific velocity you want, right? So if you have V larger than V star, it will hit the top of the cone. If V is smaller, which means the magnetic force is smaller than the electric force, the electric force doesn't care about which, what the velocity you're going at, right? It's going to give the same, it's not, it only cares about the charge. Um, so yeah, if your speed is a slower particle, will just get bent downwards and hit the bottom like this. And only those V, which exactly equals the V star that you have set up over here, will be able to come out. Yeah. You can combine this, let's call that uh, 2B, with what's called a mass spectrometer. Okay. Sounds like a very scary word again. And what this does is, let's say now you have put a velocity selector here, so you know particles come in with a specific velocity. Now put a hole magnetic field, a new magnetic field, a second magnetic field over here. Okay. So V, B2, V prime. Okay. Now this guy will, uh, let's see, current uh, field force goes up, which is not what I want. Let me flip this around. I'll make this going out of the page. So field current force, yeah, right. So, so the charge in here will experience a force like this. And then as we talked about earlier, it will get start getting bent and hit the wall over here. So if it enters here and hit the screen over here, I can actually tell how massive this guy is and how heavy this guy is. I can find the mass, okay? Just by looking at where it hits on the screen, all right? So this is the center of the, the circle, right? That's the radius, all right? So the force that is pushing it down is a magnetic force, right? So the centripetal force, pedal force is from the magnetic force, it's from the magnetic force, right? So any centripetal force is given by mv squared over r, where v is the velocity, r is the radius, m is the mass of the particle, learn that from 3a. And the magnetic force is qvb, uh, b prime in, in this case, right? So let me rearrange for the radius, okay? Uh, or maybe I should rearrange for the mass because that's what I want to find. So I'll rearrange for the radius first because that's a famous formula. Okay. So uh, the V cancels over here. Okay. So I only have uh, MV over, R is equal to MV over, uh, 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 MV over QB, like this. This is quite a famous formula for mass spectrometers. 
So if I can, so this I can measure with a ruler, right? It might be uh, six centimeters or whatever from the center of the circle, right? And you have a specific, so this you control. So you, you do know this from a velocity selector and this you also control from, it's an external B field that you can control, right? And now, uh, as if you know the charge of it, you can find the mass, okay? Now it actually doesn't find the mass, so I lied a little bit. It actually finds this ratio of uh, M over Q, it's the mass to charge ratio or charge to mass ratio. So this allows you to find the mass ratio. And why is this important is this is how they actually discover, um, they find out the actual mass of an electron. Okay. They have a separate way to find out the charge of the electron. So they, uh, I don't think I have time to go through that. Maybe, um, if I have extra time in the last lecture, I'll briefly mention it. Um, but so they have a different way to find that. Once you know Q, you will be able to be able to find the mass of the electron, which is, uh, I forgot something times 10 to the minus 30 kilograms or whatever. So it's a very important scientific discovery um, with this. So uh, you can see this is how you, it works. You have a source, you have a velocity selector over here, and then um, you bend it around over here okay, and detect it, so that's 2R. Now, uh, the final uh, quick uh, um, application is, how many of you know what Aurora Borealis is? How do I spell it? I think. How many of you know what this is? Well done, Nicole. Yes, Northern Lights. So I'll quickly wrap up with this, right? So the, um, the Earth, has a magnetic field. Um, I'll explain that next time. But it does have a magnetic field like this. Actually, it's the other way around, sorry. So, all right, so we know there's something called a North Pole and a South Pole, right? So you can draw these uh, magnetic field lines. Right? You know how to draw magnetic field lines from like this. So yeah, so that's what happens. Now, how does Northern Lights work, aka Northern Now, uh, for some reason I'll explain next time is the field lines actually go this way, not the other way that you expect. So it almost looks like this is a South Pole, this is a North Pole. Um, so technically everyone has been calling it wrong. The North Pole is supposedly a better called South Pole. <laughs> uh, if I have time, I'll explain it next time. But for, me, for now, just trust me, this is the way the, like, the magnetic field goes. Um, and what happens is the sun is extremely hot. And remember what I said with the previous example, if you, something is very hot, particles start vibrating like crazy and start shooting out. So there's a lot of protons, electrons, and charge, any charged particle, basically, um, usually protons, um, get shoot out. And some of them get shot to the Earth. What happens when a proton goes inside a magnetic field? Well, if it goes exactly, um, let's say this is the magnetic field. If the proton goes um, directly perpendicular to it, all right, that's good. Um, it'll start going into a circle, like what we just saw uh, from the previous slide. But what if it goes in at an angle? Because the sun is not angled precisely along the like 90 degrees to the fields, right? So more likely the, um, the particles are shot um, going into the magnetic fields at an angle. Now, the, only the velocity that is perpendicular, this component of it will create a circular motion. This component does not get affected by the um, magnetic force. So this part of the um, velocity will make it go in circles. The other part will make it go forward. So you'll get like a helix like this if it's shot at an angle towards the field. Well, what does, that what does that do? Well, um, then it will basically wrap around the field lines as you saw from here, right? It's a wrap around the field lines and get sucked towards the North Pole, right? So uh, now they, one would go in this way and then the other would get wrapped around here because the fields get denser and denser and closer and closer together. Now they will all start clashing onto each other. And you know what happens when things start colliding? It heats up and when it heats up, they emit heat and light. So that's why basically what the earth is, is sucking in all these um, charged particles, mostly protons into it. And then as they come closer and closer, right, they, they are hitting on each other and creating light out of this. Okay. So uh, instead of, uh, so I can show you some Google pictures of um, the, these beautiful uh, Northern lights, but instead of showing you these Google images, um, let me show you um, a trip I went two years ago to Canada. Um, Yellowknife Canada, highly recommend it. Um, once all this quarantine nonsense is gone, highly recommend um, taking a trip there. Uh, I'll show you some of my pictures. Uh, that's not me, uh, but that's me. And um, this is 
an incredible site that I highly recommend anyone um, go check it out. And in case you're wondering with all the layers of uh, outfit, that was also negative 40 degrees there. So <laughs> there's that. Um, in case you're wondering whether it's Fahrenheit or Celsius, it doesn't matter. It's cold. <laughs> Basically, by the way, minus 40 Fahrenheit is roughly minus 40 Celsius. It's one of the numbers that actually coincides. So I'll end with over here, um, showing you a couple of pictures uh, that I got uh, we, from, basically we went to on top of an uh, ice lake and uh, this was probably the maximum part of the, of the night over here. And now you know the physics behind it. All right, thank you very much for staying behind and hope you enjoyed um, my pictures as well and the physics behind it. I'll see you guys tomorrow with our final physics lecture. Have a good night and good luck tomorrow's tests. <laughs>